Hello, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is James Palmer and I've been asked to chair today's uh, webinar uh, on geopolitical risk and uh, the impact of this on international trade and investment and on the wider business uh, community. Um, just very quickly to outline the event because I'm keen to just crack on and kick off. Uh, we're going to start with a short uh, introductory presentation by Professor Simon Evanet. Simon is uh, a professor of international trade and economic development at the University of saint Galen, and uh, uh, he will help contextualize today's uh, webinar. Uh, I will introduce the other speakers after Simon's session, but with that, let me just go straight over to Simon. All I will say is we will be looking at Q&A as we go through. I may add in questions during the session, but we will try and put aside time uh, 15 minutes or so towards the end for a proper uh, discussion about Q&A coming in from all of you. So I do hope you will uh, raise thoughts on that. Anyway, it's a very topical issue. I think we're all already seeing the effects of geopolitical impact on businesses. Simon, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm just going to raise some slides and get right into it. Um, I hope you can see those slides now. I will maximize them. So, yeah. My task is to contextualize these geopolitical dynamics. I'm going to do two things in this presentation. First, I'll remind you of the economic growth backdrop, which these geopolitical dynamics will unfold in. And then I will characterize four potential scenarios going forward, which might help um, structure our conversation. And also, I highlight the implications for, for business. Now, this geopolitical rivalry that we're seeing comes at a rather unique time when you look back over the last 30 years of, of uh, the world economy. Just about every major forecast which goes forward several decades points to the same thing, which is a dramatic growth slowdown from 2030 onwards. Uh, economists may disagree a lot about short-term forecasting on, on macroeconomics, but not on longer term. The most optimistic forecasts come from the OECD, and I summarize the main points here. A key, the key finding is that when you look at all the big markets where UK businesses could be operating and global businesses, they're going to see a growth slowdown. And from the 2030s onwards, economies that grow at more than 2% a year are going to be the star, the star performers. So whatever geopolitics does to the world economy and to trade and investment flows and policy, it is going to be in a backdrop of falling growth. So in other words, domestic drivers of growth are not going to be able to count interact much of the potential harm and uncertainty which is going to be created by different types of geopolitical outcomes. That's a very important contextual point. The four scenarios which uh, I see going forward, or at least help me structure thinking about the future, are on this slide here. What I have is I'll start with the fuzzy block scenario, which is the one I think we're uh, gradually edging towards at the moment. Over the past year, we've seen a stronger uh, alliance between Moscow and Beijing. We've seen the Western alliance and sanctions and the like stick together. Obviously, Ukraine has done amazingly better than many people thought at the time. And this might provide uh, the, you know, the creation of essentially uh, a fuzzy block of Western nations that don't form a sort of uh, the, a, a formal uh, block, but uh, are very highly aligned. The same on uh, the autocratic side and a huge, big up non aligned group. And this, I think, is the sort of way station that we're moving towards. In this type of world, you can have businesses trying to straddle blocks. We can talk about how feasible or realistic that is. Uh, but uh, firms operating in sensitive sectors will face uh, even more um, restrictions, especially when it comes to exports and technology. So that's your sort of baseline scenario. If you're an optimist, you, can, you hope for President Biden's guardrails developing. Um, let's quickly talk about that. Imagine that a US-China accommodation was reached, hard to see at the current time, uh, but still it has to be put on the table as an agenda. This would almost be a back to the futures, uh, back to the future scenario for business going back to the pre-geopolitical rivalry stage, the phase where you know, policy uncertainty was much lower than it currently is at the moment. So that's a slightly more optimistic scenario. The more pessimistic scenarios are the ones at the lower part of the table, uh, you could easily envisage relations between the US and the EU souring. Uh, this could be triggered by the election of an isolationist American president uh, and, or, and or China hawks winning in European capitals at the same time. And yet 
uh, Europe finding it cannot really trust the United States. Uh, let's not forget the IRA was a, at first, a very, very divisive uh, transatlantic matter. The other parts of the world would then seek to integrate on regional terms or carry on doing so, like Africa and ASEAN. These, of course, will become uh, our large markets and will become even larger markets. Essentially, what does this mean for European businesses? They would be tied largely uh, to, uh, e uh, to the EU for growth. To the extent that international business operates, it will be developing region for region strategies. As far as trade policy is concerned, you might have much more regional policies. That is, the EU has its own block of regulations. North America has its own block of regulations. That might be, make it harder to have interoperable uh, digital policies. So data flows across borders could become more difficult. So there's a whole series of potential there for regional fragmentation or fragmentation along regional lines. So the retreat to region scenario uh, could easily be triggered after 2024. Of course, the last scenario, which I'd like to put on the table, is the creation of harder blocks amongst the strongmen and uh, the Western democracies. There would be, a, under these circumstances, a contest for the non-aligned nations, of which uh, there are well over 100 and lots of different geographies involved. The, the trigger for this is quite possibly uh, some form of conflict in the South China Sea, uh, which spills over and draws in uh, uh, the Western nations. The consequences for this for business would surely be that Northeast Asia in its entirety, not just China, not just Taiwan, Korea and Japan would largely be shunned as places for new investment. Production would move elsewhere, probably to Southeast Asia, possibly to India if it gets its act together. And of course, you would have regional dynamics uh, in ASEAN and Africa too. So looking forward, I think it might it's useful to structure uh, thinking about what the world could look like along these four different scenarios. And of course, associated with each of them will be different configurations of regional, national and multilateral uh, trade and investment policy with uh, sort of more and more restrictions as you go from the top of this uh, table down to the bottom. And I think maybe I'll stop there, putting this on the table, hoping that this helps uh, uh, get us going in our conversation about where trade and investment policy is proceeding. Thanks very much indeed, Simon. That was an awful lot of geopolitical themes summarized very, in fact, as fast as I've ever heard of that many themes drawn out. Uh, let, let me just introduce the rest of our panel. Uh, and I'm not going to go through everybody's bios. Everybody's seen those already. But we've got Elizabeth Brow, who is a senior fellow uh, in foreign and defense policy at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, welcome, Elizabeth. We've got Helene Galley, who is a director at Willis Research Network. Uh, at Willis Towers Watson, uh, looking at risk in particular. And we've also got Ed Price, who's principal at uh, Geopolitical Forecasting, Ergo Intelligence, a global intelligence uh, insight and forecasting organization. Uh, welcome all of you. Um, I'm going to kick off just building on some of the context that, that Simon set out. Just, say, just asking for, and I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to kick off, uh, any, perspectives on uh, the themes that Simon has set out in terms of those geopolitical tensions and what what is the likely uh, medium term short to medium term impact for businesses operating let's say in the UK and Europe and uh, let's start there first Elizabeth Thank you, James, and thank you uh, to the City UK for organizing. So I, the, the really the radical shift that has been happening over the past few months is, is uh, the realization in the business community that what they need to take into account is not just the, the standard um, a risk that, that every company looks at, but the totally unpredictable uh, risk that comes from from uh, from government actions uh, in in other countries, and this it's it's incredible, really. I mean, it, it, there is there is no such thing as, as an entirely peaceful world. Companies are used to to taking various various risks, including political risks, into account. But uh, in the past, since uh, since really 1991, nothing of this magnitude. And um, it's it's not just the 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 overarching risk, but the the risk uh, to specific companies. And I think this is what uh, China's retaliatory action against various 
uh, Western companies in response to things uh, their home governments have said or done. Uh, that's what that really brings home. So, for example, uh, Australia's government calling for an international investigation into the early spread of COVID. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Australia's winemakers found themselves with uh, absolutely punitive tariffs uh, in their biggest export markets. And, and I, 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 I know for a fact that Australia's winemakers don't consider themselves political. And the and same thing goes for, for uh, Taiwan's pineapple farmers or the entirety of Lithuanian industry, which really, I mean, <laughs> Lithuania's industry is... is they make various components for various various products and haven't really uh, thought about geopolitics for a very long time, if ever, because during the Soviet Union, obviously Lithuania didn't really have a private sector. And here they are uh, being punished as they were uh, after Lithuania's government uh, announced that it would invite Taiwan to open a representative office in, in Vilnius. I think it's it's the combination of, of the, the general threat that exists as a, as a result of new legislation in both uh, Russia and China. And who knows how many other companies, how many other governments will follow that uh, example and and, and uh, crack the whip against uh, foreign uh, com uh, companies in their countries. Uh, so it's a, a general threat. And then the very specific risk, uh, while small, uh, that exists for for particular for, for companies because they may be singled out for retaliatory action. And and I think what has been become obvious in the past few days is that the service sector or the professional services uh, sector is is uh, now being drawn into this as well. I think everybody on this call will have seen uh, the, what happened to to Bain uh, in China just a, a few days ago. And and uh, clearly Bain is not a, a company that that uh, thinks of itself as, as having any any geopolitical foes. It just happens to be a company operating in a country that is now uh, at uh, increasing. Uh, confrontation with various other uh, governments various other countries and and uh, the and, and I I think Helen will talk about this as well but it's the unpredictability of this risk that I think makes it particularly challenging uh, for companies uh, because it's man made and with that uh, back to you uh, James thanks very much I mean Simon I don't know if you want to add something very briefly um on on uh, Elizabeth's perspectives I mean it seems to me that, that human beings always have a tendency to over, uh, over rationalize trends of stability and not look back at longer term patterns, which, you know, if you look back the world wars, uh, uh, major expropriations, there is, this is not, this is not new. It just doesn't happen all the time. It's a bit like pandemics and so on. I mean, what, what's, what's your thought in particular, uh, in relation to, uh, the business angle as to how businesses need to look at this? So I want to agree with Elizabeth in that most of the boards that I've dealt with over the last five to 10 years were hopelessly unprepared for these developments. But people are learning really, really fast. That's the, the first uh, takeaway. This has risen up the, the agenda very clearly. The second thing is that, um, yes, there is country-specific risk. And, and uh, perhaps the biggest question many boards discuss is whether they have to choose between China and, and the United States. And where I typically sit, which is in the German speaking world, no company here really wants to choose, make that decision. Um, and uh, our American friends might be a bit disappointed if they force that decision, because there are a lot of German companies which will have much greater growth prospects in China. So yes, I buy the, that, the way that that country specific angle plays out um, is on you know, where to play and whether to have region for region strategies. And then the last thing, just to comment on what Elizabeth said, um, I wonder how TikTok feels about uh, the predictability of its treatment in the United States, because I think there's two sides to this story. I, I am, you know, I think we need to think about this in a quite balanced way, which is that both of the big players have been targeting particular companies, and uh, and this is a practice which I'm not sure uh, is uh, doing anyone any favors. Uh, I'm going to bring Helen in now. H Helen, uh, again, just on this theme about what businesses need to do and think about this. You know what, what? What observations have you got, and and what are you seeing, and what are your what are your suggestions in the context of the points that have just been made? 
Yeah, thank you, James. So I, I come from the uh, you know the insurance sector. I work for an insurance broker. I, I'm more on the research side, though, and so you know a lot of my job is to to bring some clarity in this you know, uncertain world and see if we can spot some trends that can then help companies uh, prepare better. And uh, this this uh, webinar is good timing because we very recently published a, um, a survey. Um, of, of uh, political risk that we run with a, a panel of, of clients. And really, we th there are three interesting trends that, that we spotted there. Um, the first one is that uh, geopolitical risk has become uh, you know, everyone's risk. And it used to be considered a, a catastrophe risk, uh, so lo low frequency, uh, high severity. Uh, but it seems to be no longer the case uh, and, uh, you know, Last year, I think 90% of the companies we surveyed had experienced a loss where, you know, this number was you know, closer to 35% a few years ago. Uh, and so you know, we've got to recognize that geopolitical risk now is uh, you know, very present um, on, on the board's mind. You know, it could be resulting from sanctions, export controls or outright military action. Uh, and, and there's a sense now that the, the business world and the politics uh, world has, uh, you know, they, they, they now operate in that same world and, and private organizations get caught into those geopolitical tensions, uh, as, uh, you know, Elizabeth mentioned, where, you know, whether they are intended targets or whether they are, you know, innocent bystanders. So, you know, that, that's, that's one thing where the, the profile, the risk profile has changed. Um, another interesting insight that we, we spotted was that uh, there's a... Um, there's increasing strategic competition due to uh, realignment or de-alignment. Uh, and a, a recent uh, political risk index that, that we run against uh, high-risk countries um, looked at past and current alignment uh, and found, found that over the last five years, uh, the number of countries aligned express, expressing a, a strong Western alignment had had fallen sharply, but more interestingly, actually, it's a few countries uh, that made uh, radical shifts to, um, you know, that, that made radical shifts. But what we can see is that the majority are actually avoiding extreme alignment and uh, as if, uh, you know, conveniently maybe playing, uh, you know, the, the the two parties and trying to get a political advantage uh, out of out of that, uh, and that's that has consequences for. Uh, businesses uh, uh, as they, they consider maybe French shoring, you know, the, bringing their, their uh, and looking at their supply chains and French shoring. Uh, it, it becomes a little bit tricky if um, countries realign um, you know, more, more rapidly. Um, and an interesting example in terms of of, uh, um, of this is on, on foreign aid and, you know, an interesting uh, academic um, study looked at uh, cases where China and the World Bank both provide foreign aid to a country uh, and it looks like the, the World Bank voluntarily reduces conditions it demands from uh, those loans uh, and I think it's 15 percent for every percentage of, of uh, increase in Chinese aid. So there are consequences of these, this strategic cons um, competition due to the geopolitical uh, risk alignment. Um, so you know, all this is going to impact the, the strategy that, that businesses have to uh, draw out to become more resilient in that world. Just, just, just to build on the point, I'm going to ask Ed to comment. Ed, as if we haven't got enough on our plate with those concerns, do you want to comment a bit about, so Simon's touched a little bit about direction of travel, but do you want to build on direction of travel and where you see the trends going? Sure. Thank you, James. Thank you very much to the City UK. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Simon, that was... Fantastic presentation. I'll have to go back and uh, read and memorize that. Excellent. Um, I suppose that on, on, on the trends, there are three points, um, three very broad points. James, you mentioned the past. I think perhaps one of the elephants in the room here is that we don't actually know how world wars begin. Um, there are two examples. The First World War is the example we've forgotten. And of that, there was a, a globalized world. And from that came uh, a, a global conflict. The, the example that we remember is, of course, the Second World War, and we have uh, it in mind that deglobalization, deflation, unemployment causes world wars. Actually, there are two examples. Um, so net-net, our wisdom on, on how things get very, very uh, sticky is zero. 
Um, so that's that's maybe lobbying against suggesting we understand the trend, because of course it could be that we avoid it, and I hope we do. I think the second point of um, of three I would make is that there's a fundamental asymmetry at work as well, which is that after the aforementioned Second World War, for some reason, we decided to uh, spend the last 70 or 80 years sending markets and market function and market power all the way around the world. Uh, but when it came to the two big naughty countries, Russia and China, we didn't send them democracy. And in our naivete, we, we thought that that would, uh, that would sort of catch up. Why we didn't follow the model, and I say we as the West, of how we integrated Germany and Japan into our economies and our political model, um, I don't know. Perhaps it has something to do with the rapidity of uh, atomic weapons being acquired in the Soviet bloc and in China. Um, and so the third point then is, if we're, if we're looking for a paradigm, if we're looking for a, for a, a macro trend, um, one thing I, I, I try to remind friends at home is that I've been in the, in the US for almost a decade now. And if the, if the US remains an independent variable here, it's not homogeneous. Uh, and, and whenever I start thinking about the US as, as a homogeneous body, I'm surprised and I get things wrong. I'll give you one example. I recently uh, witnessed a, a fascinating discussion, if not argument, between uh, a gentleman who had spent his career um, at the CIA and a gentleman who was still in capital markets. And this debate, this argument was about China. And the the guy that was working for the government was trying to explain to the, the, the financier, listen, you don't understand. This is a problem. And you're completely exposed and you've got to get out. And the the guy that's maybe from more from our world, he was a, he was a Wall Street type. Um, he was saying, no, you don't understand. If you get to the point where everyday business, uh, indeed capital flows, are restricted into China, you have destroyed American power. And so there's this bit, I don't know where I sit on this, probably the latter, but there's this big, big debate uh, in the US, if it's an independent variable, it matters, between do you continue along the lines of trying to, and this goes back to Simon's excellent scenarios, trying to maintain some sort of influence over China, uh, particularly China, through the dollar standard? Um, or do you risk destroying, ultimately destroying the dollar standard, that's a way out, uh, or severely impeding it because you you front load its ability to maybe influence behavior? So those, so the, the trend is is not good, I would say, but it's more complicated than um, than simply saying, get ready for World War III. Elizabeth, you want to come in? Yes, I just wanted to add to, to Ed's point about how world wars begin. Uh, there was obviously this, this idea uh, dating back even before the First World War that uh, the more you trade, the, the less likely you make a war. But what we are seeing now is that actually it's like, almost like being married. If you spend a lot of time together all the time, then you start getting annoyed with the other side. And, and that's why you see the other side's faults much more clearly uh, because <laughs> you interact with them so regularly. And that's what has happened with, with global trade at this level of interaction. Uh, uh, flaws and imperfections that we thought in the early years that we could tolerate uh, or that the Western governments, Western companies thought they could tolerate, including, for example, uh, the uh, uh, pervasive IP loss uh, in, in China. That is all of a sudden uh, has gradually become a much more serious issue. And especially now that it, it joins geopolitical issues as, as, as an issue of concern. Um, and so it's we are seeing is the the uh, the apex of a lot of concerns that have been building over the years, uh, especially in China and Russia. And and then uh, Ed, if I can just follow up on on your point about why we not why we didn't bring uh, democracy to to Russia and China. I think uh, Western governments tried, especially in Russia, they they did try very hard and they funded uh, every manner of NGO. And and that uh, and not only did it not bring uh, a viable democracy to Russia. It also aggravated people in charge in, in Russia to the point where they say, well, why are you interfering in our country? Now we're going to interfere in yours. And so paradoxically, that, that contributed to the sort of friction that we're seeing now, where Russia is, the Russian government, those in charge in Russia are rebelling or uh, uh, rebelling, asserting themselves vis-a-vis -vis the West. Over. Thank you. I, I'm just going to. I was going to pick up on that point about um, uh, about the democracy too, but Elizabeth has covered it. I, I think that the other observation I'd make is 
I don't think I think it's very easy to look back and think of things we should have done differently, but we kid ourselves that we've got certainty. And I think there's always going to be uncertainty and there are always going to be human judgments which will uh, transpire with hindsight not to have been ideal, but actually doesn't mean that at the time you make them, you'd have made a better decision. And it seems to me it goes back to the fact that there's an embedded greater degree of uncertainty in the world than we all want to think there is. I regularly describe the asset management industry as an industry defined by trying to create a false sense of certainty about the performance of companies. Uh, and I think there is something in that. And I know we've got some of my asset management friends on the call. But um, uh, I, I, I want to just turn away from these rather bleak trends, which I largely share, uh, to what do we actually do about it in terms of controlling controllables? What does the what does the West do? What do we do in the UK? And what's the UK influence of businesses and government to try to deal with that? Um, uh, again, I don't know whether Helene, you want to kick off on that, and then I'll come to Simon on that. I mean, maybe first, there's a lot that businesses can do. I mean, they're not just uh, helpless in front of those challenges. And then, then we can see business practices uh, evolving. And then there's some, you know, very good news, for example, the, the increased use of scenarios. So, you know, Simon, it was good to see, you know, some of your uh, scenarios and, and we see many more of our, of our clients playing those out and in a new way involving different functions in the organization rather than making it only a, you know, a risk manager um, um, problem. So th that's good news. You know, it's just uh, you know, breaking down those silos and, and trying to play out some of those uh, scenarios and, and the, the consequences. Um, this being said, against that, that trend, you know, some, we, we, we've seen comments from clients saying that facing the decoupling in the world, they, they're having to decouple some of their operations uh, to, to reduce the risk. Uh, so, you know, you've got a trend of, of fewer silos, maybe at the boardroom, and then there's, and there's siloing some of the operations uh, to, to protect the business. Um, so you know, that, that scenario analysis is better. There's in, definitely in, increased awareness of those risks for, uh, for, for companies. Uh, and increased demand we've seen for risk transfer programs but they're not the only solution uh so you know yes you can ensure uh, against some of those risks but at some point you know once the the house is on fire it's difficult to get fire insurance so you know you, you it's really important to to look ahead uh and um and, and plan and, and see what's on the on the horizon um but in in terms of how organization can work more with with, with um with, with governments, I mean, maybe a, a good example I, I saw recently talking to some of uh, my colleagues in aviation, um, you know, they, they were looking at the impact of sanctions uh, imposed on, uh, you know, after the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine la last year. And, and those sanctions were imposed with immediate effect. And, and I think they were imposed on, on the Friday. So that means my, my colleagues in the, the Bergen team were very busy over the weekend trying to find out what was going to happen to all those contracts and you know, whether you could actually fly planes. Uh, and, and it looks like, uh, and well, in that case, it's not, you know, it's, it's uh, the EU rather than the national government. It looks like some of the details of the practical applications of the sanctions are not being thought through. And I, I wonder if some more dialogue and consultation or understanding of the practicalities of you know, doing business uh, would would help in future to to make those sanctions a little bit more uh, you know, easier to to apply. Uh, so, for example, for some you know for about a month there was um, uncertainty about what the sanctions meant about uh, flying over Russia, uh, or you know the, what would happen if we needed to have an emergency landing in in Russia or. Uh, and things like that, you know, just knowing are we insured or not, you know, which are very, very important questions. So I think some of that dialogue uh, and, and more of a two way dialogue uh, than just handing over some limited intelligence. And I think that would be quite, quite um, useful. And that's, I think that's something that you know, Elizabeth on the, uh, on the National Preparedness Commission in the UK, you know, your, your commissioner as well. This is a theme that we've discussed just encouraging a more two-way dialogue between government and the business world rather than a, a, a one-way dialogue, which is possibly a bit more the norm. Simon, do you, do you want to add on that? And, and then I'll bring Ed in on this issue about, uh, about what business and governments in the, in the UK can do. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I echo some of what Ellen, Ellen has said. I mean, in the companies that I dealt with, it's, this is, yes, for uh, scenarios are taken more seriously, but we really, the decisions really come down to two, right? Where to play, so where do they want to allocate their new capital? Where, and that's why I started my presentation on where the growth is going to be, because that's a very important decision driver in where people uh, wish to allocate capital in the future. Uh, and then the question is how to play. And I'm actually struck by how many of the manufacturing companies I deal with who, who've already had region for region or China for China strategies anyway. And that actually then narrows down the set of questions and concerns that they have. So I think companies are, you know, they have moved a long way down this track. The list of geopolitical risks actually, when you go into their specific circumstances often thin out more than you might have might have thought and then you can have a much more structured uh, uh, conversation so there is that now on the you know on on where uh, where business does have to you know, worry is on sanctions regimes and uh, uh, this is an area where of course we've had 10 sanctions packages from the EU and we've had multiple from uh, other part, other western democracies too and one has to wonder about the coherence of these sanctions and what we're trying to accomplish. Are we trying to punish the Russian economy? That's contract the Russian economy. Are we trying to deprive the Kremlin of revenues? So you might hit export. Are we trying to encourage firms to exit? Are we trying to encourage decoupling? The sanctions packages you put in for those different objectives are different. And what we have at the moment in places are, I think, sanctions which are not particularly coherent. I don't want to say they're a dog's breakfast, but they're clearly areas where uh, there are tensions. And, and, and these need to be talked through, clear case for business talking to government. The other aspect looking at the Russian sanctions, which worries me, is I wonder how much the Western sanctions have taken account of the Russian counter sanctions, uh, which are in place. And, uh, and so I'm sure you know, we haven't had to think about sanctions of these girls for a long time. And I'm sure people in government are getting a lot more sophisticated about how they do this, uh, but I suspect there's some room to grow there as well. And business, of course, needs to be part of that conversation. Ed, Ed do you want to add anything on this? Well, I'd agree with this point, and I, and I would um, say that as someone who spent four years working in the British consulate, um, tasked with exactly what we're talking about, communicating with business, in this case, financial, the financial sector, um, I would lobby nowadays for a fundamental rethink of how governments and businesses talk to each other. Uh, I don't think for a second that I was ever dishonest or adversarial, but the, the foundational principle of government communications, um, I think, was created by Peter Mandelson, right? It's the idea that you that you present a message, and it's the idea that you present a very coherent message. Maybe Maybe it wasn't Peter, maybe it was somebody else. But I think we need to move away from that idea into some sort of radical honesty. And we need to establish who it is that's senior enough in businesses to be sat down and really told what's what. Um, maybe they maybe they have some access to some intelligence. Maybe they have access to some sort of scenario planning. I don't know. That would be above uh, what my pay grade was. But I, but I do think that now, now is the moment for um, everyone to realize that they're a national champion in a sense and to really have an honest conversation about, look, is it going to be the case that pursuing some degree of globalized uh, positive GDP change in period one has something that will, that will uh, uh, cause a problem in period two and to what extent. And just to try and get onto the same page where governments and, and senior business leaders sit down, maybe in a green room, and, and talk through the sort of scenarios that, uh, that Simon just presented. I, I can't resist adding, I'm just in the middle of writing what will be a very dull article on uh, the complexity of regulatory thinking and the tendency to to try and fix things through uh, regulation or legislation as an answer, as opposed to actually thinking through the substance of what impact it will have. And, and it ties in with issues about long term policy making and strategic thinking in government, which which all of you have obviously been thinking about, and the impact for businesses. And frankly, the, the deficit in that long term thinking, which we clearly see in in governments, uh, in many cases, I'm not going to say in all cases or consistently, but but and I think that's a challenge, and it's a challenge that arises with greater complexity that we've got around the world. You know, when I started work nearly 40 years ago, the complexity of businesses was way way lower. The interdependencies across jurisdictions were way way lower. Um, uh, Elizabeth, you've got got your hand up. I just the the point I'd like you. I'm going to bring you in, Elizabeth, and then I want to just ask a question about risk and whether we need to be taking more risk in the world rather than just thinking we can manage away all risk. 
uh, and it ties in with Simon's growth point. But Elizabeth, come on in with your thoughts on this. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Ed's point. I'm in, in violent agreement that there needs to be more uh, exchange between government and senior business leaders. And there are a number of such efforts underway, currently uh, hampered by the fact that there is legal uncertainty, and this is maybe an area for you, James, to, to expand on yourself, uh, legal uncertainty or unclarity about whether governments can include or invite just some businesses to be part of this conversation, and uh, what happens to the, the companies that are not invited, uh, can they claim that they're being unfairly excluded, even though this is not about commercial opportunities, it's about strategy and geopolitics, but still companies could make the case that uh, it's unfair if they are not invited, and uh, if, how do you make the selection? You can't invite every company. So that's that's uh, where that stands. Uh, I know to the frustration of, of the, the pioneering governments that have tried it. And I, I don't know, did you want me to, to come in on something else? Or maybe, James, maybe if you want to, to add to this yourself. Well, well I'll, I'll add to that. Look, I'm not a world expert in every form of competition law, but I think it is completely insane to think you can only engage with the world by communicating perfectly with everybody at the same time. I think that part lies, lies madness. Uh, and uh, I've certainly participated through uh, 29 years with government on regulatory developments, many of which were confidential on a private basis where there's been disclosed to some companies. That seems to me eminently sensible. There are clearly duties of confidentiality, clearly inside information issues, all of those kind of issues that I think we need to keep our uh, our heads heads on straight and uh, not completely lose the plot. It's It's an example of, I think, overthinking principles. You know, we have principles of competition law, but everything is about proportionality. And I think if we only worried about competition law, then the world would be a bit of a disaster. Uh, I think we need to think about different priorities. And at the moment, competition law may not be the single most important priority as we face geopolitical risks. I will tentatively suggest, and I'll wait for the broad... Amen to that. Yeah. Uh, I, there's, there's five partners in this building who won't speak to me after that comment, probably. But anyway, um, can, can, I, can I just come back to my point uh, about taking of risk. Because I think when we talk about what businesses should do, we tend to talk about reducing risk, mitigating risk, looking at supply chains and so on. But, but Simon made the point about growth and the growth opportunities and where those lie. But it also seems to me there's, there's just greater volatility, there's greater unpredictability as well, inherently. There's not a perfect route map to where we go. Do we just need a world that is more accepting of levels of risk, uh, which is not a world that investors, the markets, voters, consumers have been used to. But is that just is that part of the answer? Simon, maybe given your growth comments, you'd you'd want to come back on that. Absolutely. So James, there's a there's a, there's a um one of the sort of leading frameworks on how you structure international business strategy emphasizes uh, the fact that if you're a company based in a country with there's high levels of political risk find other countries which have different types of political risk, which kind of ensure you against this. Now, that principle of sort of risk diversification, which yeah, is ages old, must surely come back here into, as companies think through what's the right portfolio of activities around the world, which help sustain that company over the next year you know, or through this period of geopolitical uncertainty. So I think old principles, we have to, we have to apply them new context, fair enough. Um, but surely, uh, the avoidance of risk is probably not the recipe for corporate success. Ed, I don't know if you want to add on that. Yeah, you read my mind. Thank you, James. Yeah, I think I think when we use the word risk colloquially, we misuse it because we we're thinking about we're thinking about downside risk. There is, of course, upside risk. Um, it, it does appear to be a natural law in the universe that that they have a relationship and that the relationship is positive. So if you take on more. Um, uh, you know, apparent upside risk, it's like junk bonds, right? We all know it. I don't need to explain that to anyone. But I completely agree with you that this kind of um, shrinking violet attitude to the world now doesn't really make sense. And if, if we go back to, if we are indeed the West, and if we are indeed some sort of block, then we should go back to our core brand, um, which is uh, packing ourselves into tiny ships and sailing out and finding new things. Um, and I think we should um, try a little bit of capitalism, honestly. And I, and I don't think it's a problem. And I think we're going to be okay. And I, I think my, my even more provocative point is, is it's not necessarily even about diversification. It depends what your model is. I mean, if you're, you know, I, th I think we should be seeing businesses that take a punt on one jurisdiction or another. If they've got investors who are willing to go for it, 
go for it. I mean, again, I, I'm happy to say this is, this is not Chatham House. We're recording this, but I was chair of our firm for a period and we were in Moscow. We expanded. We were one of the two or three largest global law firms in Moscow. We closed in a very, very short space of time, very fast with very significant cost impacts in the year of closure. Uh, we understood why we had to take that on the chin. You know, I, I actually don't have any regrets about our decisions to expand in Moscow. You know, you don't know how things are going to work out. And it would have been a, an odd decision because if one had taken the decision not to grow in Moscow with the information we had when we were being encouraged by governments all over the world to grow there, which, by the way, we were, uh, going back to the model of trade maybe helping develop Western values, democratic values, social liberalism, and so on, doesn't always work, but it may not be a force uh, that is negative always, is my idealist view. And I still believe in that view, just don't guarantee it. Uh, you know, I, I think if we decided not to go into Moscow, there would have been a whole load of other countries we wouldn't have gone into as well. And that's a very different model. And again, to be a bit provocative, but speak truth about it, how many people, if they hadn't gone into Moscow, would have gone into Ukraine? Uh, and I think, you know, we have very different views on those jurisdictions. So I think the hindsight lens is a, is a dangerous one to get too carried away on. I'm, I, 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 I'm, everybody's hands flown up. I'm going to go to Helen first. Uh, and then Elizabeth, and then back to Ed. And I'm going to ask you to be relatively quick because I want to turn to quite a few questions that have come in. Yeah, th thank you, James. I just wanted to come in on, on risk um, because I don't think we can uh, make make that disappear. And, and you know, we talked about di diversification and the risk and reward. Uh, I think there's also sort of trade-offs, and you know, we can see some trade-offs. And if, if we give a few examples, uh, we've been used to the just-in-time economies where you, know, they, you try to make things as efficient and lean as possible. And you know, we see lots of, you know, lots of companies coming back from that and looking at a more of a just-in-case approach of saying, well, let's have a little bit more stock or let's invest in energy storage. So there, there's that, there's just changing slightly the equation. Um, but also, um, you know, another example is um, rare earth elements that our economies are relying uh, increasingly for, you know, for the phone or all the, the renewable uh, technology. And, um, you know, it's been convenient over the years to leave that messy business of extracting rare earth materials uh, to uh, to countries like China or, or African countries. Um, but um, when the supply chains get disrupted, then you know, we start seeing the, the cost of that. And, uh, but there's a reason why you know, the, these, um, this extraction has been left to those countries. It's, it's, it's messy. You know, it creates lots of waste. Uh, I think uh, I know, for one ton of, of, uh, of rare earth material, you, know, you probably create, I think, you know, 20 tons of, of waste and including radioactive waste. So it's um, a risk of reshoring these activities is actually an environmental risk. So are we prepared to trade that and accept that on our shores or maybe you know, investing in technology that would manage those risks? Uh, you know, the risk of uh, local communities not being very happy to have that on their, in their backyard. Uh, but in, in, uh, in, in, in th this might be an acceptable risk if you then um, uh, make your supply chains a little bit more uh, resilient to geopolitical shocks. I'm going to come back to environmental issues, which we got a question about in a moment, but Elizabeth and then and then Ed. Actually, that segued nicely to what I wanted to say with, or, or bring up, which is uh, the, the views of the public. Uh, uh, the public, especially Gen Z, uh, is uh, extremely vocal about what they want, what they expect from companies. And and they express it, and they they launch uh, social media boycotts of brands that they think are not doing what they want them to do. And we have seen social media boycotts of of, of companies that uh, didn't leave Russia quickly enough, or that are active in particular countries uh, other than Russia. And in particular, uh, there's interest in, in companies that operate in, in Xinjiang region, and and so it can be any issue, any time. And I think that adds to the unpredictability that companies face. Uh, the, the the public, especially younger people, can go off on, on any issue and launch these um, social media boycotts. Doesn't mean that that actually they will be able to boycott a lot of or achieve any significant uh, decline in sales through the boycotts. But but that reputational damage is 
it, it just frightens companies, rightly so, especially since they are so concerned about ESG. So I'm glad you brought in the environment, Helen. Uh, companies are so concerned about ESG and, and, and their reputational risk connected to uh, not doing the right thing in that area. And I think geopolitics is entering that uh, that uh area as well where companies have to be extremely concerned about what the public will say and we have seen uh, just in the past few days a boycott uh, against um, uh, absolute vodka uh, which wanted to go back into Russia and and it was a massive uh, social media campaign of it in Sweden as a result and that is also extremely unpredictable because it, it if it just happens to be the case that that people picked up on the fact that that this brand had gone back into Russia, some other brands may have gone back and nobody noticed, and and they are doing the submarine strategy at the moment. But it's just an extremely perilous and and an unpredictable um, scenario uh, reality to operate in. Over. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ed. A quick comment. Yes, I'm certainly not uh, boycotting vodka myself. Uh, just a very quick comment. I think that we've been obsessed with safety. We've been obsessed with de-risking. I think if you look at economic policy in the last 15 years, it's completely incoherent. You had uh, Basel III tell banks to lend less. You had the Fed telling banks to lend more. And all we've done is cook up a bunch of problems. So I think if we, if we get back to some sort of understanding of Schumpeter, uh, or at least some sort of acceptance of a business cycle, we'll be in a, we'll be in a happier place. Thank you. I, for one, deeply agree with that. I want. I said I want to expand on the environmental question. Can, can we just? I mean, how do how do you all feel? We've got a question, which I think is a great question. How do you feel that the energy transition, the the uh, the shift to net zero, the reduction in emissions, is going to tie in with these geopolitical trends? We've already seen it complicating massively the position over Russia and Russia sanctions. Uh, Simon, do you want to kick off on that? I think James, I mean, you, you just you started at the right place, which is that once we've seen the repricing upwards of energy, we've learned just how much our populations can tolerate um, high energy bills and all the rest of it, and businesses, uh, how much they can tolerate um, uh, paying uh, elevated prices. And you see the huge demands for subsidies from the German industry, for example, in order to get through last year and into this year. So all of that makes me a little bit uh, skeptical about how much of the transition that we will see by 2030, or put it differently, I think we're going to see, we should moderate our expectations as to how much of the transition towards net zero occurs by 2030. And then with that, there will, of course, be quite possibly a big backlash, possibly from Generation Z and others, to say that this is the latest betrayal. And that, that another source of division within our, you know, the Western democracies on this. And of course, for the, the strongmen club, they will be looking at this and just laughing, thinking, well, look, we told you so. We were never really serious about this. Uh, so I think, yes, geopolitics starts it. The reverberations in Western domestic politics will exacerbate this, and, and uh, we will be living with the consequences of this. And again, we, I suppose what this ultimately means is that more of the discussion will shift to adaption. Uh, and then you know, the geopolitical side of adaption is who finances the cost of adaption in the non-aligned world, how much of it is going to be financed by the West, the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, other countries. Yeah, and I think that's the you know how this ultimately plays out geopolitically. And the wealth balance is very different for funding that from what it was thirty years ago. Um, uh, Elizabeth, do you want to comment quickly on that issue as well about the impact of, of the net zero change, energy supply, and so on? Yeah, I would just add again uh, the uh, the voice of the public, which is I, I think we are we all remember a previous era, at least a little bit of a previous era of globalization, where really geopolitics didn't didn't enter into the debate because uh, the 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 hostile side, as it were, was not connected to us through commerce, and now it is not just connected but an integral part uh, of our daily lives. So. Uh, I, this will lead, I think, to, to massive uh, debate and, and disagreement within our countries. Uh, can we expect uh, to uh, keep our current standard of living, our current uh, size GDP, or do we have to expect a lower standard of living, uh, declining uh, GDP for some time to come if we if we are become more more aware? Uh, more concerned about the geopolitical aspects of of uh, or risks of of. Uh, uh, considerable exposure to Russia and China and whichever can other countries decide to join their informal alliance. Um, and, and this is, I think, uh, an honest debate that needs to happen in, in um, 
in the public in our Western countries, yes, we we can uh, retract a bit from these uh, uh, challenging countries, uh, but that will lead to higher consumer prices and and lower growth. And and is that something that we are willing to to accept? We as the public, and I think if if we as the public in, in, in voting in elections where this is articulated, if we say yeah, this is what we want, then fine. But if we don't have that conversation, then we will end up with just. Uh, uh, really destructive uh, uh, disagreements further uh, further down the line, which is also what happened with globalization, by the way, nobody or politicians didn't articulate the pros and cons of globalization to the wider public when it was, uh, when the, the big push happened in the, the late 80s and early 90s, and then people discovered that, oh, my reality is changing radically, I don't like this, I'm going to vote for a protest party, or I'm going to, I, I, I just don't like this reality, and I'm going to make my voice heard, and, and Let's. Uh, I hope we'll uh, avoid such a fundamental uh, disagreement uh, this time around. So I'm glad you raised that point for what it's worth. That's one of my biggest concerns is that we have that uh, exacerbation of populism and you get even worse judgments, even more short term judgments and you get in a spin. And I think if you look, that's often one of the triggers of world wars. Uh, if you do look at that is you get you get people who have not thought things through. You don't have checks and balances. You have individuals taking decisions. Uh, and uh, 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 I certainly don't pretend I have the answers, but it's certainly easy to see the patterns and the trends. And you look at Weimar. Germany post the First World War and the instability there that comes with economic deprivation, loss of expectations and so on. So I think I think these are real challenges out there that we tend to ignore. Um, uh, Ed, I just going to turn to you. I, I want to come back to the point about um, about engaging with governments and what businesses can concretely do. Now, we're sitting here, this is a webinar for the City UK, and having been on the Leadership Council of the City UK for nine years and gone to plenty of meetings with ministers with them, it, uh, and this is, this is, I wasn't paid to do a plug, but it genuinely is an incredibly connected organisation with very, very high impact. What should the City UK and other trade bodies and other businesses be doing about this? And there was, there's been a talk about honesty here. And, and I'm kind of keen to draw that theme out a bit more because I think there's been post-financial crisis, a bit of a, a, I'm interested in whether there are any reactions. There's a bit of a nervousness about challenging government in public, which didn't exist in the first part of my career of engaging with government, that people were much more comfortable doing so. Are, are we having an honest enough debate with governments about risks, about long-term consequences, long-term challenges and solutions to these big issues? and the mitigants and what strategically needs to happen. Ed. Yes, thank you, James. Um, I, my sense of, you know, I've worked on both sides of the of the coin. My sense is that, um, on, you know, depending on which side of the coin you're on, you weren't quite making sense to the other side. And that and that fundamentally has to change, I think. Um, but it's, it's terribly difficult because I think there are a few elephants in the room with regard to what it is we would exactly be talking about. And, um, we are talking about them on this on this webinar. Are we going to be poorer? Are there going to be super significant migrations across the face of the earth due to climate change? Um, is there going to be conflict and so on? Back to again, back to Simon's excellent slides. Um, and so in, the the public sphere is degrading. Um, and you know, twenty years ago, perhaps we were in you know we were in something of a fairly dishonest environment, but it was foundationally honest. Um, and, I, and I think if you look back at uh, previous leaders, uh, John Major, for example, in the UK, um, Bush Senior in the US, th these were like the best of the best as individuals. And uh, I will certainly not mention any names because we are being recorded, but I think the modern crop of politicians in the US particularly are not of the same caliber. And that reflects how um, very difficult it is in this bewildered social media environment, in this bewildered public sphere, to just sit down and agree on the facts. Um, so it's, first of all, number one of two, it's hard to agree on facts that are facts that are facts. Number two, it's hard to agree on hard facts. Um, so, I mean, if I just, I'll make one point that pulls back a little bit into what we were saying. Uh, I'm, I'm often thinking about the economist Malthus. He said, of course, that population growth was exponential and resource growth was linear. Do the math, that's a problem. Um, but one thing that we're going to have to discuss as governments and as business is that it's worse than that. And, and Malthus didn't quite see it as, as gloomy as it is, because what if resource uh, degrowth is exponential? Right. So I think we're in a very, very difficult position 
And we don't currently have the tools, the honesty to use the same word, the space to even talk about basic things. Thank you. Um, Helene, did you want to add anything on the, these rather sweeping issues in our last couple of minutes? You're, you're on mute, Helene, do you want to come off mute? Thank you. There's always one. <laughs> uh, just on, on that, uh, on the, the, the the climate issues that we you know, we talked about just just now and and, and you know degrowth uh, etc. I, th I think I, I work with many climate scientists and they're increasingly uh, uh, showing despair. I know scientists usually are in the labs and they're you know looking at their science and increasingly they're on the streets uh, uh, men, de demonstrating and, and despair that there's such a gap between what they're saying and, and actions uh, taken. But for businesses, uh, we don't have to wait until 2030 to see the impact of uh, missed targets. Uh, and now I wanted to mention the, the, the real serious challenge of climate liability for companies as they uh, make the, publish their plans of, of net zero by 2030, 2050, which often are, are just plans. And you know, if they are not shown as being very substantial, uh, this can put them in a very tricky position uh, um, in face of activists or or, um, or or shareholders, so that that is a real um, you know, current challenge that I think hopefully will will encourage more more movement uh, on, on that front. But you know it's tricky. Um. Thank you. Um, I've just got got one more minute, and I'm going to uh, let Elizabeth have the last word. Um, uh, Elizabeth, any further reflections from you again as to what? what companies should be doing about this and you know what are the positive things that people should actually be, be doing further in this context i uh, thank you for, for giving me the last word i think mask is a good example the the shipping uh, company after they were hit by that massive cyber attack in 2017 that really crippled the company they didn't uh, crawl under a rock and say, you know, I hope nobody notices and and uh, and uh, let's not talk about it. What they did instead was uh, go out far and wide and talk about the fact that they've been crippled by a cyber attack, uh, but emphasizing how much better they were set up. Uh, as a result of, of the, the measures they put in place after the cyber attack. And I think it's it's a very clever strategy. It's a mystery to nobody that, that we are in the midst of massive geopolitical confrontation and, and fragmentation and enormous risk. And so I th shareholders, uh, potential shareholders, customers, potential customers will all be concerned about that. And, and if companies can show that they have thought about it, they've put measures in place to, to reduce the impact of whatever might, might happen, even if it's a man-made action that is really, uh, as, as discussed, unpredictable, they uh, can actually uh, uh, put themselves in a very good place uh, to, uh, to, to convince anybody that, that, that they want to interact uh, with them, that, that they are well set up for whatever may come their way. And, and if we have that, uh, we can also have that across sectors. The banking sector is a, is a really good example of that. And, and for example, I know that the Bank of, of England has worked uh, very, uh, very uh, energetically with retail banks to, to shore them up against cyber attacks. So mm -hmm. that is uh, demonstrating uh, resilience, uh, regardless of, of what threat may, may come uh, the company's way. And I think with that, my six, 60 seconds are over. Well, look, that's a perfect note to finish on, because I, I, I think that it's good that we have a little bit of optimism. I think we can be pessimistic about the context, but I, I, which I am, but I'm uh, actually I am optimistic about people's ability to adapt. My, my, I, I think you've all drawn out and probably depressed, as I have too, our uh, audience. Uh, and thank you to the City UK team for arranging this. Thank you to our attendees for, for joining us. But thank you most of all to all of you. I, I think that it is, it is absolutely right, as you've all drawn out, that governments and businesses can be too prone to assuming stability based on actually fairly limited patterns of behavior over fairly limited periods of time. Uh, but but I, I think my urging is, is if we look at COVID, I look at the way that the normal rules of response were torn up for certain of the responses to COVID as the way forward. And I think in a world of greater challenge, greater sudden change, volatile impacts, uh, to me, the solution is not to stick with the processes of 
impenetrable risk elimination and caution and a lethargy to be a bit provocative, but also I think accurate, which we normally apply to liberalization or changes. If we need to respond quickly, let's focus on outcomes. And I think there will be opportunities for businesses to contribute to that. But I do think getting governments to think long-term and to realize that they and their parties will be labeled as failures if they don't actually engage in the positive opportunities from these issues, which I think are, are actually many. Anyway, that's my uh, summation of the discussion, but thank you all so much. And thank you everybody for joining us.